Hi everyone. I suggest we give it one more minute because we see that participants are still coming. We will start in a minute. I think we can start if colleagues agree. So welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are uh, in the world. My name is Marilyn Neven. I'm program manager, EU liaison at the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance or International IDEA. We are an intergovernmental organization with 34 member states and have the sole mission to support democracy uh, across the globe. It is really a great pleasure to welcome you all to this online event on behalf of my colleagues at International IDEA and at the European Commission. We have high ambitions for today. We are going to review the impact of two summits for democracy today and discuss the attention points we see for building a successful third summit and follow-up process. The moment is indeed right for such an exercise. About three months ago, the second Summit for Democracy took place and was successfully organized by the US government. Um, South Korea is now taking over the helm and plans to organize a third summit in the first half of 2024. Today, International IDEA launched uh, the Impact Report, Democratic Engagement After Two Summits for Democracy. I hope you will all read it and my colleague will also post the link in the chat function so you can immediately take a look. It was drafted with the support from uh, the European Union. It provides an in-depth analysis of information on the two past summits for democracy that was made available either publicly or through the cohorts. And we thank everyone who has uh, contributed uh, to information sharing. A white paper is now being prepared by the US for South Korea, and we hope, of course, that our report can be part uh, of or inform the handover package. And we are really, really thrilled about your massive interest for this event and uh, the evaluation of the summit process. This pre-launch was initially conceived as an informal online gathering among uh, the project partners and summit experts but we realized on the way uh, how many of you have been involved in the Global Democracy Coalition, the democracy cohorts, the official summit structures, and our uh, summit activities since 2021. And we also saw that there is a great appetite for helping to shape the future of the summit together. So that's how we ended up with such a big audience today. So welcome to you all. To manage this uh, discussion, this conversation for the next one hour and a half, we lined up some exciting speakers for you and also made the chat function available to answer some of your questions during the sessions. Don't hesitate to make use of that. My colleague Julia Koitgen will present the report and uh, the discussants will each comment on a specific chapter, highlighting either the specific country engagement or works for a spe uh, specific democracy cohort. Julia and the team will also take over the mastering during the session to conduct a poll, so we count on your uh, active participation on this. 
So let's start. Uh, I may now introduce someone who probably needs a little introduction for most of you. My colleague, Judia Kortgen, is program manager at International Idea, and she is leading the EU-funded uh, supporting Team Europe Democracy uh, program. Julia will tell you more about the report, about the most interesting country commitments and the key recommendations uh, moving forward. She will highlight how the research was done, provide some facts and figures from the summit and indeed zoom in on the implementation of commitments. Julia, you and colleagues looked at the goods and the bads of the process and, and managed to draw some uh, constructive proposals for further streamlining of the process. So we are very much keen to hear more on this. The screen is yours, Julia, please. Hi, thank you very much. Very nice to, to see you all. I'm very happy that so many of you are, are gathered here today. Um, so, as Marilyn already introduced, I we have been working um, very hard for the past couple of months since March, actually, to really drill um, all this, all that happened during the the Summit for Democracy and the Year of Action, and and go deeper in in the, the analysis. So. I just want to briefly just explain how we've come to that report, just so that we're kind of clear on the methodology that we used. Um, we, we reviewed actually the, the all the data that was available that we could find, the ones especially around the verbal statements that were made by countries, um, the 13 self-reports that we had available at our disposal, um, online sources that we could find, like the US website, for example. And then what we did is we um, basically did a transcript of all the verbal commitments. So that's about five and a half hours of recording um, of all the heads of state and governments that made um, statements around the implementation of commitments. We checked online to verify because some of the verbal statements um, were quite unclear on what it is exactly, which plans, for example, they were talking about. And so we clarified that um, in the analysis we've done. And then uh, we did several interviews with stakeholders, both civil society organizations and different cohorts. We also did a survey and distributed that to all the cohorts. And what I just want to say is that the um, commitment implementation or the analysis that we've done, especially around commitment implementation, was really based on these verbal statements. So we aren't necessarily um, judging the quality of implementation, um, or we haven't gone to every country to check um, exactly where they were. Or, for example, we noticed that some countries made commitments during the first summit that then didn't mention anything in terms of implementation um, during the second summit. So we haven't necessarily, we don't necessarily know whether those um, commitments have been followed up on or not. So we're not able to provide any analysis, specific analysis on that. Um, what I just want to say is that today I won't be going into any of the details regarding a description of the second summit. I know it was um, confusing for some of you, but all of that is in the report, so you can see in detail what really happened um, during the few days and during the, the actual summit day. Um, I just want to start off with a little bit of facts and figures, as we did uh, previously for the first summit. Um, we've been hearing that there's been, um, during the second summit, a lot less uptake. Um, we don't necessarily find it in, in that, um, yeah, it's not necessarily really the case. So just uh, want to say that there were about 120 countries invited. So the same 112 uh, as in 2021, but eight additional countries as well. And we have all the details of that in the report. Um, again, Hungary, Turkey uh, weren't invited, but there were also countries that were invited twice, but declined participation. Um, so in the end, 90 countries participated. So we take that information from the verbal statements that were made, not from the panels that actually were held during the event uh, on the 29th, of which uh, 80 um, were active or participated in both summits. 
um, and 10 only participated in 2023, but didn't participate in 2021. So basically what we can conclude is that we have 10 fewer countries that participated in 2023 versus 21. That represents in total about 46% of the population. And when we know that according to Freedom House, um, I'm talking how now about um, 2022, we know that 38% of the population live in not free countries and only 20% live in free countries. So basically that means that a lot of not free countries or less free countries were represented also during the summit in terms of its um, population present. Um, so, Looking now specifically at commitment implementation, as I said, we've gone through all the verbal statements. We found that about 69% of all countries mentioned actually concrete implementation and 31 did not. That also means that the countries that didn't participate in 2021, of course, did not mention concrete implementation, um, just to, to clarify that. Um, we also found, of course, that there was poor accessibility of data, as I said before, um, it's a recordings basically that we did um, transcribed into um, in, a, in order to be able to do the analysis, apart from the self reports that we had available, um, which of course provided a lot of information. So as you know, next to the verbal statements, there were these panels, these five panels that were organized that focus on various themes. And we've partly looked at that information as well um, to come to, to those kind of conclusions. Just to mention that um, IDEA has a dashboard with all the commitments um, of all um, participating countries during the first summit. And so all of that information, um, what the commitments were exactly can be found there as well as um, the self-reports that we had available. You can find that under, implement, under implementation in that particular category. So um, looking now specifically at the themes that were mentioned again during the verbal statements by heads of state, um, we see a couple of trends here. First of all, um, themes such as corruption, transparency were important in this first summit, keep being very important in the second summit top category. And then we have themes such as gender, um, media freedom, and elections that also are important in, in the top category of themes mentioned. Surprisingly, but inconsistently with the first summit, institutional strengthening uh, themes, um, such as, for example, parliaments, parties, local democracy, um, are less present, actually, uh, are hardly mentioned. Themes like youth, for example, um, despite being quite important um, in the year of action and the second summit with a particular theme around youth was not um, mentioned very much in the verbal statements by heads of state. What we see um, also in terms of the themes is that security, um, fighting extremists, fighting author authoritarianism have become increasingly important and themes that we see coming up much, much more in the verbal statements. And of course, specifically that, as you know, it, there was no war in Ukraine in 2021 during the first summit. Uh, in the same way, um, of course, there was, but the full-scale invasion only happened after um, the second summit, after the first summit, so, sorry. So this uh, was mentioned actually by 39 uh, countries and mostly European countries in their verbal statements. When we now look at um, the commitments, what we have done in the report is that we have taken the main themes um, so corruption, gender, media freedom, and elections. We have taken those four themes and we looked specifically, we, we categorized those. And you will see there is, for example, if you're looking specifically at corruption and you wanna know what country um, implemented a commitment around whistleblower protection, for example, you can see that in the report. So there's quite a lot of information around these four themes in the report. But I just wanted today um, to mention just four countries um, where we find that the implementation of commitments were actually quite interesting or useful. 
Um, so those those are here, um, the ones you can see, and we'll hear more from Valerio later, but uh, Moldova adopted a new electoral code um, that strengthened the capacity of the Central Electoral Commission. Ecuador did something quite specific, which is a platform to on public procurement data to make that transparent and have a LGBTI diversity action plan. Um, Zambia conducted a post-2021 general election review, which engaged lots of different stakeholders and reviewed also um, uh, the transparency of their electoral commission. And the US, as you, you probably know, established its presidential initiative for democratic renewal with quite a, a substantive budget. Um, what I also wanted to mention here is, because that is quite important, is that as you know, there was no monitoring mechanism, formal monitoring mechanism around the implementation of commitments. However, two countries, Kosovo and Spain, established or used a national um, accountability mechanism that enabled to actually review um, within their country the implementation of their commitments. Um, what we also have looked at is whether countries within their verbal statements have made uh, new commitments. And we found that 30 countries made new commitments, again, despite the lack of clarity whether countries should make new commitments or not. So we're still not very clear about that. But despite that, um, some countries went ahead and already committed something for the future. Um, of course, this again is much clearer when we have um, uh, self-reports, when those are available, there's a lot more um, information around those. Again, as what we see for the first summit, uh, these new commitments vary in specificity, but again, because they're drawn from verbal statements made by heads of state, it might also be the reason why they're not um, that clear in all cases. Again, I won't read them. You can see all of that in the in the report. Now I want to um, go back, go to the second part of um, this presentation and and the report, which is around the cohorts. Um, I assume you all know what the cohorts are, but just to go back to them, there were sixteen cohorts. They are multi stakeholder. Um, initiatives that focus on certain topics, and you can see those uh, topics here on the screen. Um, what we, we say in the report is that they were probably the most active part of the whole summit process because they had very regular meetings and they had some very key outcomes. Um, their multi-stakeholder nature, the fact that they were civil society, government, private sector driven, that really helped also uh, to bring some of the underrepresented voices around the Summit for Democracy. For example, some of the cohorts included civil society organizations from non-participating countries. So that meant that um, countries that weren't invited in the summit had still participation through civil society. Um, we also find that at least 11 um, cohorts actually contributed quite substantively to some of the thematic analysis that they've done or some calls to action um, to the summit process and to really pushing from, for some of the issues um, around the, the summit. And finally, um, at least six cohorts actually developed already uh, concrete plans for the future. And again, in the report, you can see that in detail what those plans are. And this again, despite the fact that, um, first of all, they weren't officially part of the summit. And secondly, that um, there is again, no clear plans on whether the cohorts will continue um, in the future moving forward and towards the, the third summit in South Korea. Again, here, I wanna give some examples. Um, again, I wanna highlight that there are only examples. There's a lot more that was done. And so we have done a cohort paper um, a few months ago, where some of this out is outlined as well. I think uh, my colleague Nikolai will put it also in the chat so you can you can see it. 
Um, but some of the examples here um, where it was something that was nicely coordinated by some civil society colleagues of, of Freedom House, but um, there was a civil society declaration on uh, democratic principles, which was coordinated by the 14 cohorts, but then signed by 135 civil society organizations, really um, helping or pushing the government to take action on democracy. Um, we had the financial transparency and integrity cohort um, that did a beneficial outcome, uh, beneficial ownership outcome document, for example, for governments. The gender uh, cohort that did recommendations around certain themes uh, to again for governments. We have the media freedom cohort that did a report that highlighted some commitments. Um, that different members of the cohort actually took moving forward also into uh, the third summit and beyond the, the second summit. And finally, we have also the youth democracy cohort um, that developed some model uh, commitments and a handbook on youth political uh, participation. Again, these are just examples. There is a lot more done um, that was done and you can find that also on the website of the State Department. I want to now go into the future of the, the cohorts. So this is based on the survey that I mentioned that we've done. So we send a, a survey to all the cohorts just to see where they are um, in, in terms of their thinking. Again, that's, that's uh, about a month and a half ago. So things might have changed a little bit since. But basically what we um, saw from that is about 60% of the cohorts said we will continue. We will continue in the current form, we'll maybe change, we'll maybe some of the cohorts are integrated into a coalition, for example, but we are planning to continue. 40% were still a little bit uncertain, also probably due to the fact that the process is still a little bit um, uncertain. Um, but what we noticed generally, or what we were told, is that there needs to be a clearer structure for the cohorts, that some kind of coordination would be extremely helpful. Um, many cohorts were, were actually um, saying that some funding would be really helpful to push some of the work forward, because a lot of this was done on, on everybody's time, and, and a lot of the the outcomes that they would wish to um, to do weren't possible because of, of partly lack of funding, partly um, also time related. And that in the end, broadening the core leadership to, um, to organizations and governments beyond Europe and the US could also be quite, uh, quite good moving, moving forward. So more broadly, also what we concluded around the cohorts is that they were very useful in establishing networks, in bringing different actors, bringing governments and civil society together, and also partly into, um, I don't know, maybe Katharina will talk about it, but breathing new life into existing uh, initiatives that, that were kind of stalling. Um, so we saw that happening quite a bit as well. So now moving into the final part of the report, which is around civil society representation. Um, so what we've seen here is that there was a, during from the first to the sum, second summit, and also during the year of action, there was a lot more civil society inclusion and representation. Um, as I mentioned before, also in terms of the breadth of civil society organizations. So we saw some civil society organizations, for example, uh, representing people with disabilities. We saw that um, in, you know, a, a lot of the, them participating to indigenous groups, young people. So generally that's something that, that we, we, um, we saw from the first to the, the second summit, as well as more opportunities for engagements uh, before and during the second summit. Um, we also have the Global Democracy Coalition that did uh, Partners for Democracy Day uh, on the 27th of March mainly, um, which had you know, quite a, a lot of events, quite a lot of organizations, civil society organizations that got mobilized around that. But at the same time, we think that it's important, as I mentioned before, to keep broadening the participation 
of civil society moving forward um, into the third summit, but also um, not to leave civil society just there, just really try to see uh, how the dialogue between civil society and governments can actually be improved um, into the, the third summit, trying to find this platform for dialogues between civil society and governments beyond also the work of the, the cohorts. So now I wanna move uh, very briefly into the recommendations. Um, again, the, what we have done there is we've looked at shorter term recommendations and longer term recommendations. I will just look at the very short term practical ones. You can look at the longer term recommendations and our thinking um, after this analysis also in the report. So again, there's a lot more there, but for um, time purposes, I, I just wanted to focus on some of the shorter term considerations. Um, so we've also categorized them depending on who we, um, we were making those practical considerations or recommendations to. Um, in terms of the summit organizers, um, we're thinking that um, the commitment actually, despite the fact that they're very uneven in terms of their results, we thought that the commitments were actually a good way to bring civils, uh, to bring um, governments to uh, continue engaging with this uh, process. But um, it's important to request exactly what those commitments should be and communicate really clearly around expectations on their content um, and do that well in advance. So not one month before the summit, but start looking into, into that. And then also looking in, at the, the work of the cohorts um, to have more of a coordinated approach to them and also invite the cohorts to maybe submit plans or different reports on the progress, on, on how they're doing, maybe connect some of them together. Um, so this is something that we thought could be done pretty, pretty quickly. Um, in terms of the governments, again, you know, we are all for making sure that there are written uh, commitments, but not just written commitments, but some that are measurables with clear outputs, timeframes, um, and outcomes, and, and be transparent and open around this and publish it um, also uh, to their citizens. So we very much see that this link between um, commitments and citizens is in some cases lacking and in others it's been done, but again, um, not systematically. To the democracy cohorts, um, engage really in a structured uh, collaboration, also working with other cohorts if possible and fostering some of the lessons learned. Um, the good thing about the cohorts that there's been very little structure given to them, which has enabled uh, the cohorts to be you know, to freely go and, and do lots of different things. And we think that's really amazing and should be kept. At the same time, there is a, a lesson learned between the different cohorts that could really be beneficial for, for all of, all of the, the cohorts. Um, and then also reach out to include organizations from outside the EU or the US, uh, but also other civil society organizations within a region or country, for example. Um, and then finally, to civil society organizations um, engage with the governments around uh, the development of new commitments. Uh, we think that that would be really, really great. Um, and then pursue some kind of involvement with new civil society organizations, um, as I said, in countries or regions in, in a structured uh, manner. So, so that's um, that's some of the... Uh, highlights of the report. I hope you will find uh, interest in, in looking through it and, and, and um, yeah, finding more analysis um, that's useful for you. And we really look forward to, to any feedback um, on your side. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation, Julie. I'm sure that uh, participants will check out the details uh, in the report itself, and they will see that the recommendations indeed do not only target summit organizers, but also the governments, civil society, and actors 
uh, engaged in uh, the democracy cohorts. So you see from all the examples that uh, the Summit for Democracy indeed provided a forum uh, for very interesting initiatives and from many stakeholders. What I also liked and uh, perhaps can add uh, to the presentation is that the report also discusses uh, some broader questions such as the value of making democracy engagement as inclusive as possible. And we see that there is an increasing need uh, to build a shared uh, narrative on democracy between uh, North and South. Uh, International ID also just published a policy brief that unpacks the building blocks of uh, renewing uh, uh, the narrative on democracy and we focus it on uh, EU work. Uh, as we see that the value proposition of what that means for different regions uh, will be key to, to get countries on board and to keep them on board. And we hope to see that also in the continued summit process. So now, uh, thank you. And uh, let's turn to our speaker, all of whom spent lots of their time uh, on the summit process, and they can share some valuable experiences and, and viewpoints with us. First of all, uh, we can discuss Moldova, uh, who is one of the very good students in the summit process. The government published a self-report ahead of the second summit and uh, was very responsive to our team in the framework of the project. A key focus uh, um, of the country was elections and anti-corruption, and we have seen in Julia's presentation that these were very uh, important topics uh, for many countries taking part in, in the summit. Uh, Valerio Kupcha is very well placed uh, to provide some more details on this as he is the head of uh, the International Cooperation Directorate at the National Anti-Corruption Center in Moldova. It is my pleasure to pass on the floor to you, Valerio, please go ahead. Good afternoon, or I guess it might be good morning for some of the participants. Um, I'll just briefly refer to, to the... Um, commitments that we, we've made within the Summit for Democracy. So we've made the commitments under three headings, or you might call them areas. Uh, first of them is the justice sector reform. So the commitment was to continue to tackle the uh, to take the necessary steps uh, to, to reform the justice sector and to, to vet its judges and prosecutors. And we are uh, currently in an ongoing uh, uh, process of evaluating the ethical and the financial integrity of judges and prosecutors and of their self-governing bodies, uh, namely the Superior Council of Magistracy and the Superior Council of Prosecutors. Uh, another area was the, uh, the one referring to the strengthening of democratic processes by fighting illegal financing of political parties. Uh, uh, the commitment was to continue to make efforts to strengthen uh, the de democratic uh, processes uh, by enforcing uh, strong mechanisms of oversight and sanctions for infringements that might be identified and for the illegal financing of political parties. And it, it, was, uh, uh, it, it was already in the presentation that there were some uh, important amendments which will give more leverage for checking the income of parties and set rules and specific limits for donations. Uh, the next, the third uh, uh, area is the one referring to the strengthening of anti-corruption bodies and cleaning up the institutions. And the commitment was to continue the fight uh, against corrupt practices and schemes in public institutions to work towards strengthening the existing anti-corruption bodies, uh, appoint transparent and honest public figures and leadership uh, in leadership positions, uh, and by discouraging corrupt, uh, corrupt uh, practices and strengthen of accountability and enforcement mechanisms. Uh, regarding this, this area, we had the honor to, to co-lead a cohort on uh, anti-corruption with uh, uh, our colleagues from the Basel Institute on Governance and Transparency International. On 8th of uh, November last year, uh, uh, we've uh, had the first meeting and we've launched our cohort. And this meeting provided the opportunity for 
government representatives and the civil society to to shape the scope and uh, expected results of the cohort by uh, sharing the initial reactions, recommendations, and questions regarding the cohort's uh, um, high-level objectives and activities. Uh, the participants uh, came up with uh, proposals regarding the organization of cohort's activities and the key areas on which it might focus. First, the attendees came uh, to the conclusion that the cohort must focus on uh, very specific and practical areas, uh, like the international cooperation in the investigation of high-level corruption and on asset recovery cases, which are uh, crucial to overcome the impunity associated with serious corruption cases. Um, for this purpose, the, the cohort met in two workshops. Uh, the objectives of these workshops were to, to share the knowledge, experience, and the best practices with regard uh, to investigating high-level corruption cases and uh, illicit asset uh, recovery. Uh, the first workshop on the investigation of high-level corruption uh, cases uh, took place on uh, the 2nd of February, and the second workshop related to to the illicit assets recovery was held on uh, February 16th. Uh, the workshops gathered around 120 participants, and the follow-up for of these uh, workshops were the the recommendations uh, that were put together. Uh, they were somehow grouped in four priority areas uh, for action and the reforms. Uh, in relation to, to international cooperation and investigations and asset recovery. And these four priority areas are the strengthening of compliance with international standards, uh, widen the scope of international standards and domestic legislation, strengthen the international uh, operational coordination and cooperation and enhance domestic enforcement uh, and uh, asset management capacities and practices. Also, uh, within the, the Summit for Democracy, we had some bilateral conferences, like the, the bilateral conferences with our uh, colleagues from uh, France and Romania on exchanging the good practices uh, with regard to, to asset recovery. Uh, these, these meetings allowed uh, our institutions uh, to, uh, to meet and to, to present the, the best practices we have uh, with regard to asset recovery and address the, this subject in a transversal manner as a cycle involving different institutions. Uh, well, we also had the honor to, to host last year the, the uh, annual professional conference and the General Assembly of the European Partners Against Corruption and the European Contact Point Network Against Corruption. And during the, this event, uh, 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 Kishinev Declaration was adopted and six new new members uh, and observers were, were accepted to, to the network. Uh, with regard to, to our future priorities, uh, we, we are planning to, to draft a new anti-corruption policy document. And the recommendations that I've mentioned uh, represent the outcome of the workshops that took place will uh, uh, for sure be taken into account when, when drafting a new anti-corruption policy document. Uh, we, we, we've also related again to, to the international cooperation with regard to the investigation of high-level corruption cases and asset recovery. We, we've recently submitted our request to become a member of the Globe network of the UNODC. Uh, it was mentioned in the presentation, uh, the, the uh, whistleblowers. We, some two weeks ago, I guess, we, we've approved a new law on whistleblowers protection. So we, we hope that this new mechanism will, will, will work and, and encourage uh, the, the reporting of illegal activities. So this was my, my brief presentation. And if there will be some, some questions, I'll gladly answer that. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that, Valerio. And please stay with us as there may be questions uh, after the first round of comments and uh, because it's very interesting what you have done and, and uh, participants may want to have more details on that. Um, I will now pass on the floor to Julia or Nikolai, my colleagues, because uh, the plan is to conduct a poll with the participants. Julia. Yes, so thanks very much. We want to get a little bit of active participation here. There's lots and lots of questions, so we're going through them and we will um, address them. Um, but uh, so thanks very much in advance already for all of your comments and, and questions. Um, so just I want to we want to put a quick poll. I mean, some of the as I said, some of the work we've been doing is around uh, looking at recommendations. So we just wanted to see um, on on this particular part around government participation um, to the summit. What are some of the recommendations that you think? would be, just choose one that you think would be the most important according to you. Would it be more important to develop commitments in a consultative process with civil society? Or do you think these commitments are not useful? Provide regular reporting on the implementation of, of commitments or actively engage with civil society to facilitate monitoring, raising ambition of your new commitments. So I will just give you a couple of seconds now um, to vote. And we will see your answers here on the poll. Um, I know that we have government participation. We have also civil society participation. I think civil society is probably a bit, a little bit higher, um, which might explain partly also uh, the results. All right, so we closing the poll and the answer is to have more to actively engage with civil society to facilitate monitoring, raise ambition, and fuel new commitments. Thanks very much. Thank you, Julia. Perfect. And we'll see you back later because there are more questions, I think, to submit. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Katarina Nielsen, who is project associate at the Alliance of Democracies. As you know, the Alliance has been following the summit from the first row. We are keen uh, to hear more uh, about the results of the summit cohort that focused on resisting authoritarian pressure. It has become a shared strategic interest in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And this was proved by the fact that so many leaders at the second summit included references uh, to it in their remarks. So we also commend that cohort uh, for building the bridges with the other cohorts. We really think that that was a good practice uh, to follow. And uh, so therefore, Catherine, good to have you with us. And uh, you are welcome to take the floor for your remarks. Thank you, Marilyn. So I'm going to keep it brief and I'll stick to three main points about the cohorts. And um, the first would be our cohort activities, that is, the resisting authoritarian pressure cohort. And then I might go into some report findings uh, based on what you guys have said about the cohorts and then some takeaways and hopefully some future advice for the next summit in Korea. So our activities, um, so as part of this year of action, um, the Alliance of Democracies Foundation in partnership with the Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Freedom House, created the Resisting Authoritarian Pressure Cohort. Um, the purpose of the cohort was to build resilience to authoritarian coercion and offer support um, to Democrats and human rights defenders working in non-democracies. Um, we officially announced this during the second Future of Democracy Forum in Vilnius um, in November of 2022. So as you may know, the uh, cohorts came out with deliverables and these are sort of our action points. Um, I think, and I might be biased to say, but our cohort was quite successful. And I know um, Katie is uh, from Freedom House is on the call. And I think she might agree with me that we were quite a small team. Um, so we were quite flexible and quite efficient. Um, some of these deliverables were that, for example, Lithuania commissioned a mural of Alas Biliatsky, a Belarusian uh, human rights activist um, who was currently imprisoned by the Lukashenko regime uh, directly outside the Belarusian embassy in Vilnius, which was a physical statement, uh, we think. Freedom House, um, as mentioned by you, Marilyn, 
also uh, try to engage all cohorts together. But more than that, they also engaged um, governments. So they prepared this declaration to combat transnational repression um, that governments endorsed to show their commitment. And um, this was signed by countries such as Australia, Germany, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the US, um, et cetera. Um, we also, uh, in terms of the Alliance of Democracies, we held an online event on economic coercion um, with uh, our founder, Anders Bo Rasmussen, SecGen of NATO, former SecGen of NATO, and um, former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull. We also released an updated memo outlining our economic article five, calling on democracies to sort of build a global framework um, to fight or counter economic coercion, which has actually seen quite a lot recently um, in the EU, uh, in the US uh, and in Japan, for example. Um, and to keep this momentum going, as one of the questions were, if we wanted to keep um, the cohorts going, we actually hosted Freedom House and the government of Lithuania for a panel at the Copenhagen Democracy Summit this year um, to discuss our cohort activities and sort of give us some stage presence on it um, and to continue the, the talks. Um, and then I'll go back to the report, um, which we had a great presentation of, um, especially with regard to the cohort discussion. Um, so I, I agree a lot with, with the finding of the reports in terms of the cohorts. Um, to solidify this, um, I think our cohort was really effective in raising awareness on resisting authoritarian pressure, um, as well as committing to the focus of this, which was the aim of the cohorts initially. Um, I think a lot of our activities were actually spurred on by being part of these cohorts. Um, so I think that was a really good takeaway from that. Um, but while many of us did extensive work, um, and I know Casey's on here from Freedom House, she was sort of our coordinator, and I know she put a lot of time into it. Um, I do feel like there was this missed opportunity, which is mentioned in the report, um, because I feel there should have been more engagement in, in the um, official agenda for cohorts. Uh, it was mainly just governments, but the cohorts worked with those governments, and therefore I feel there should have been an overlap there. Um, I think it was also mentioned um, that organization, I think we also struggled a little bit with organization. We really appreciated the freedom, meaning that we had all our ability to focus on these deliverables, but there was this aspect about organization and not knowing when things needed to be submitted, et cetera, um, due to sort of a lack of communication. Um, and our hope is that now we've built on this year of action and the cohorts is that next year in Korea, the cohorts still maintain a role and have more of a sort of linear pathway to being uh, featured during the official summit. Um, so I guess then I can move on to our my third point, which is these takeaways. Um, I think the first one, which I found, and I know that my team found extremely important, was to keep the cohort small. Um, we were also part of the democracy tech cohort, uh, not in a steering committee, but still part of the discussions. And those calls were filled with a lot of um, organizations and partners who wanted to have a say, but it became difficult for us to see a way we could produce um, tangible outputs. By keeping it small, uh, we were down to three members. We were in really close contact and we could get things done efficiently and also in um, an easy way. And we agreed on things very, very efficiently. Uh, a simple call between the three of us and we were uh, building things building setting stones, really. Um, we also created some solid partnerships between us where we saw Lithuania and Freedom House have both since uh, worked with us on the same topics, be that in Vilnius, be that in Copenhagen. Um, and also I know the Freedom House in Lithuania actually had a side event at the Summit for Democracy, which sort of tied everything together for us, even though we weren't featured on the official agenda. Um, I think the idea behind the whole cohort creation makes a lot of sense. Um, it has really spared us on ensuring we actively work towards the goal presented. I think 
specifically in uh, for us at the Alliance of Democracies, we've run with this economic Article 5 for a few years, but being part of this cohort meant that we needed to rejuvenate that and sort of uh, breathe new life into our ideas. And that meant reading, uh, well, going back on our project proposal and um, redoing it, bringing in new light um, and working with the cohort on it. Um, and I think in general, the Summit for Democracy in Korea, uh, we hope that this focuses on cohorts the same way that it did last year um, in terms of this year of action. But um, I think civil society and the government relation is quite a smart uh, method of ensuring, uh, of creating a safe space for uh, democracy upkeep um, because civil society is obviously an essential part of that. I think what we could propose for the next summit would be something uh, whereby, firstly, cohorts have cooperation. I don't know if Freedom House led, led that, but I think cohort cooperation and maybe sharing some um, deliverables or figuring out what deliverables do you do and how do you go about them and sharing these ideas could be very useful. Um, I would also propose the official method in which cohorts could be included is perhaps um, using governments, using the links between governments and the cohorts, uh, other members. Uh, for example, if Lithuania spoke about it, they could speak about their cohort membership and then progressively have round tables, et cetera, for those that are interested in joining this or being part of this or agreeing or committing to some of the ideas. Um, also maybe featuring some panel discussions, perhaps about the topics. Um, so for example, if it was the tech for democracy, then they would have those partners like Estonia up on stage, et cetera. Um, so that, those are my takeaways. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina. I remind that you kept the cohort small, but at the same time, you found uh, some very good ways to increase the outreach and the impact of the cohort linking both with governments and uh, other cohorts. So thank you very much for inspiring us on that and perhaps also South Korea. And uh, stay tuned over to Julia now uh, for a new poll. Yeah. And maybe also just to say, I think that Katharina also already um, addressed some of the questions there around our, did cohorts actually bring some new things or was it some of the old stuff also that came back? I think we can say it was really uh, both. Um, but let me go now to the cohort. Um, so the second cohort is really around um, looking at the democracy cohorts more specifically. Again, if you were to choose one of the following recommendations, which one would it be? To support the establishment of a coordination mechanism that facilitates some of the planning, the reporting, the cooperation, something that Katharina uh, mentioned the pledge uh, clear financial resources for uh, activities of cohorts to or to provide a more structured engagement in the summit, including, for example, a formal place in the agenda. So I give you just a couple of seconds to um, respond to this uh, poll. I think uh, we can close the poll. Um, I think it's been quite clearly uh, that the, it's, there's a need for more structured engagement of the cohorts in the summit, including a uh, formal place in the agenda. This is something that we've heard uh, quite clearly also during the uh, in the survey results that we we did. So thanks, and I hope hand it over back to you, Marilyn. Thank you, Julia. And I guess if there was the option to have all three of them, uh, participants would have taken it, but it gives a view on that. And indeed it is part of the uh, report's conclusions uh, as well. Now, our third discussant is Willis Onyango, who is the executive director of the Youth Cafe. Youth Cafe is a leading part of the summit youth political and civic engagement cohort driven by the European Commission and the European Partnership for Democracy. Willis comes from Kenya and participated in the project from the very early stages with participation in dialogues event last year and also this year in the summit in Costa Rica. So you have a great experience there 
uh, you have been invaluable to International Ideas Country work on the summit as well. So thank you very much for being here, Willis, and uh, feel welcome to take the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Marilyn, and uh, good evening to, to fellow panelists as well. It is great to see uh, 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 colleagues like Julia again, albeit virtually. I will um, uh, take the opportunity, first of all, to reflect on the report which Julia has done a good job of um, in giving us its highlights. Uh, but for me, I'm keen on you know, the role of the civil society you know, coming from Kenya, living here um, and, and working uh, in the sub-Saharan uh, region. Uh, I, I think the report does a good job in terms of breaking down the how you know the civil society might play a, a key uh, and, and cr critical role in the summit for democracy processes uh, with respect to uh, uh, a pathway towards a more representative and inclusive, inclusive voices within the civil society itself, um, as as well as making a case for meaningful you know engagement of civil society in the summit. Um, uh, it also uh, you know gives um, <clears throat> the state of play and recommendations uh, as it relates to you know, the first summit and the second summit. Um, uh, and apart from that, the increasing um, civil society representativeness, for instance, who, who is being represented. And when uh, we start with the, 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 fourth, the, the fourth pillar, which is uh, you know, an attempt to broaden the, uh, the, the, the space for more actors within the civil society to uh, to be represented um they we 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 saw of course in the, compared to comparatively the first and the second summit more um spaces for um, new entrants you know those who typically would not have an opportunity to take part certainly ourselves uh myself you know the the logistics of travels uh, uh, the preparations and the ability to influence at, at, at high at high levels. However, more needs to be done in terms of um, having a, 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 a real meaningful representation. If we look, for instance, our heart's um, um, ladder of representation of youth uh, who we work with from, you know, uh, uh, from cosmetic representation to uh, the highest level, which is meaningful uh, representation. We saw, um, uh, and, and this also speaks to our experiences in terms of um, bringing these uh, perspectives and views in different panels and spaces that were provided for uh, through the Summit for Democracy. However, a lot uh, needs to be done in terms of including young, pe young people, actors within the civil society that are hardest to reach. We, uh, certainly myself, I'm based in Nairobi, we just did uh, a survey of 197 organizations um, um, <clears throat> to look at the ecosystem strengthening among young youth-led organizations. And we found out that 63% of these organizations are in rural areas, much to our dismay. So how do we uh, you know, reach those who are uh, in, in semi-urban and rural areas with, you know, activities um, around, around the summit and even at cohort level. That is a key, um, um, uh, a key aspect. Uh, great uh, pr prospects in terms of the inclusion of um, organizations uh, working with uh, people living with disability. Uh, ourselves, our experiences, uh, we work through uh, we work with a number of young people living with disabilities um, um, uh, 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 as well. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, <laughs> disaggregating who, who takes part and who is in the room, uh, we can uh, go, we can do a better job in terms of uh, 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 going further to include marginalized uh, groups, women-led organizations. Huge, um, huge, huge gap. Our survey also has just told us that only 18% of uh, entire youth-led organizations are led by women of, uh, out of the 197 organizations. There's a few uh, of recommendations and food for thought. Uh, in terms of um, <clears throat> the meaningful engagement and, uh, and, 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 and particularly the creation of, uh, of net networking opportunities uh, to influence the summit, and it is great 
that uh, we are not only talking of uh, documenting commitments made by government, but also commitments made by uh, civil society organizations themselves, which is, which I think holds uh, you know everyone to account uh, in terms of what uh, what, the, what 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 they can do. Um, I find it, uh, an innovation in terms of uh, also documenting the work of the private sector and the commitment made by the private sectors, because oftentimes private sector also work in countries where we work in, and uh, they can be allies uh, in terms of pushing for jo joint message messaging. So just as Julia uh, uh, mentioned in her remarks that uh, uh, we need more collaboration between the civil society and you know, the governments. Uh, but now how do we even forge further collaboration between civil society and the private sector and go beyond the usual, um, you know, uh, actors that uh, uh, civil society are, are, are used to, you know, uh, collaborating with. Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, when we, we also talk of representativeness and, and inclusion, I know the binary in the report we see a uh, more uh, uh, binary depiction of the world into north and south, so global north and global south. Uh, that is uh, great for high level, you know, reporting. And um, uh, uh, my recommendation is that we could go further and see, you know, in the global so how how are we getting in terms of specific countries or regions, uh, for instance, to give you an example. We, when I say when when I took part in the Costa Rica, you know, the, the uh, summit in Costa Rica, a number of uh, countries in Latin America were, you know, very very adequately represented through through the different civil society organizations. But would you say the same uh, uh, in Zambia, where we also had a, 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 a summit? How many you know civil society organizations from Africa were took, took advantage of the Zambia summit to? To push the issue, so we see these disparities that we can go further uh, into uh, different reg region in terms of depicting them and finding uh, pathways uh, uh, pathways forward. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, uh, the success uh, of our work, of course, uh, we uh, we witness uh, certainly myself. I have taken part very actively through. Uh, uh, our organization um, taking part in panels, you know, bringing youth youth views based on our own experiences and work and ongoing research, um, uh, taking part in pre preparatory activities. I think that was really really great because you know the 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 process is complex and sometimes um, could could have you know shifting goal goalposts and dynamic you know activities in between. So I found the preparatory. Uh, activities, for instance, uh, the uh, global um, uh, uh, coalition, uh, democratic coalition event in Brussels that prepared, laid the ground for preparing the civil society in terms of messaging uh, for the onward summit to be extremely important as it served to, you know, also onboard, almost an onboarding, you know, process for, for new actors who are finding the process at that particular uh, particular time. A uh, great, uh, um, uh, in terms of pushing for youth representation in different panels, we took part in uh, high-level high panels and were able to, to bring out, you know, uh, uh, our positions. Um, uh, we, we, we endorsed, you know, uh, position papers and, uh, you know, provided reviews and feedback, which I think uh, can only be, uh, can only be built for, uh, be built up upon. Uh, one recommendation as we, think of the next you know, uh, summit is to uh, work towards localizing some of these engagements. I know sometimes the, the, the timelines might be short, but it can, uh, it can add immense value and insights and, re and enrich the process you know, if these preparatory processes are you know, at in-country level, uh, at regional level, so that we have you know, uh, issues that are unique to uh, to to regions and to communities feed uh, uh, feed into the project, and uh, this is this also interfaces with some of the exciting things we are we are beginning to work on um, in collaboration with the youth democracy cohort through you know some of the resources and 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 and, and opportunities through the sub grants that have been provided, and we are. Uh, 
very excited to have a project that will you know work with uh, with, with, with 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 young people in in selected uh, communities and, and 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 nations to you know uh, bring their voices in more structured way throughout the process uh, over the next um, <clears throat> over the next several months uh, these are some of the highlights and i hope it can build upon a robust um, uh, youth input um, uh, certainly from uh, from uh, uh, region the region we are working which is primarily sub-saharan sub africa into the process in a, a manner that was not witnessed before so that when we eventually compare the second and the third um, uh, summit we can uh, we can conclude uh, and that there were more you know participation from young people from civil society uh, in africa in the in the in the processes otherwise thank you so much and uh, congratulations again on the good report Thank you, Willis, noted, and uh, thank you for being very concrete on what you found were good practices for youth engagements, both in the summit at, uh, and at uh, country level, but also pointing at some challenges uh, you may see and you we may want to work with uh, for the next uh, process. I believe that Julia has a third poll question for us. Yes, so third and final poll, again, um... Alex, sorry, I know that probably all three are relevant, but this is just uh, for you to, to try to see which one you believe is would be the most relevant. So looking now specifically at civil society uh, participation, if we were to look at um, or to choose one recommendation, which one would you choose to pursue a more diverse participation to the work of the democracy cohort? to pursue a more diverse participation through the work of international initiatives, such as, for example, the Global Democracy Coalition, or to pursue a more diverse participation by broadening the countries invited to the summit. So I will let you uh, give you just a, a couple of more um, seconds to uh, look at this. It's shifting a little bit, but no, it's remaining uh, point two, which is to pursue more diverse participation uh, through the work of international initiatives such as the Global Democracy Coalition. I think my colleague Elisenda and lots of you in the Global Coalition are present here, so I guess that's a message for you guys as well. And um, so we're going to uh, stop sharing this now. There we Thank go. Marie, back much. to you. Yes, and I believe I'm uh, looking at you, Julia. I believe we have a bit of time uh, to take a few questions uh, for further discussion. It's really a pleasure to see that in the chat, uh, many are actively participating in already providing answers to the questions. So I'm not sure we need to cover all of them. Julia, please, uh, uh, you may come in and uh, prioritize here. I see that uh, among the question was also what uh, the consequences can be of uh, the current wave of democratic backsliding. It was Isa to asking that question. And she's also asking what the expected impact is on, on uh, of global advocacy for democracy for uh, autocrat leaders. And it is definitely interesting questions. For myself, I also thought it would be useful to ask our panelists if there is one key recommendation they would like to transmit to South uh, Korea for the next summit, what that would be. But over to you, Julia, as you may uh, want uh, to discuss other questions. Yes, so thanks very much, Marilyn. I'm just going through uh, some of these questions. Thanks so much for all of this very important uh, contributions that you guys made. That's great. I think, Courtney, your point is well taken that some countries didn't necessarily decline to participate, but some just simply didn't respond. So that indeed is a very important distinction that we should uh, make and that we've actually uh, made in, in the report. Um, I think, uh, Devin, your point around commitments that were made as a 
result of the S4D. We haven't gone in that granular analysis uh, of exactly, as I said, the implementation of commitments. What we did notice is, for example, that a couple of countries mentioned the transposition of a directive, of an EU directive around whistleblower protection. So in this case, of course, those were commitments that were made at the summit, maybe, uh, in, in some of the cases, but weren't necessarily as a result of the summit, that would, they would have done it probably, or they would have done it in any case. What we can't judge too much is whether they would have done it in any case, um, but maybe accelerated some of that, given that there was one year specifically to report on some of the implementation of commitments. That's why, um, you know, our recommendation would still be to continue uh, sort of doing that. There was a lot um, of discussion around this um, international commitments in particular. We found this much less clear in the verbal statements around the second summit. Uh, so this distinction that was in some instances quite clear around the commitments that were made during the first summit, especially when they were written, and this distinction between at home, domestic and international, I think this was came out much less clear in the verbal statements. As I said, except for things like um, the, the invasion of, of Ukraine, that was much much clearer, of course, that it was not of their own country that they were talking about. Um, just uh, very briefly also on my side around uh, OGP, there's been quite a few com um, uh, comments around uh, OGP and, and that linkage between commitments made at the summit and, and at OGP. Of course, um, I think that's something that OGP has been working on um, as well as is, is seeing indeed that some of the commitments made at the summit and the implementation were actually also OGP commitments. Um, but also some of the commitments were part of um, other larger initiatives, for example. So we've, we've noticed that um, as well. Uh, Moldova is an, is an example of that. Um, what else that I just want to uh, quickly uh, look or pick out from, from this side here? Um, the same thing with cohorts, whether initiatives under the cohorts were things that had already taken place or not. Um, as, as this was uh, illustrated uh, by Katharina, um, to some extent for sure, but not necessarily always the case. We hear about the media freedom uh, cohort that they took some things also from the media, uh, some of the works of the media uh, coalition and gave it a new new meaning or new uh, breath, a breath of fresh air basically. So we've seen that coming up in a, in a couple of cohorts. So um, not necessarily new, but uh, of course some of it most of it was new, but also an opportunity to uh, give new new air to or new new ideas to initiatives and and bring in new actors, for example. Um, some of you have expressed frustrations. I think this goes from commitment implementation to cohorts to the summit. I think this is something that we try to also recognize in in the in the, the report, as well as, as I said, all the good work that was done. Um, some of the data around the, the report, uh, a lot of the data is already uh, in there. Um, if you have any particular questions around some of the data, also feel free to, to reach out. Uh, Katie from Freedom House sharing the Declaration of Principles um, to Combat Transnational Repression and the great work generally also that that cohort and so many others have done um, in this process. And as, as I said, we try to recognize it um, as much as, as possible. I think the question of Isatu, I think there were a couple of questions there and some of the responses of, of you guys um, around, you know, the, the what this process really brings um, in terms of commitment of countries to democracies as, as a larger, broader question. I think what we recognize in the report is that the Summit for Democracy is definitely has a lot of flaws, as I think we all, all recognize, but it is a an important political space um, because it gets together many heads of state um, and governments. Um, and, and we believe that it is a, a space worth salvaging because 
it allows countries at the highest level to discuss the importance of democracy um, in their country. Um, so that's just some of the comments from my side, uh, but maybe I'll hand it over to um, Valerio. Yes, please, Valeria, or any of the speakers who would like to come in with some final remarks. Uh, great if you could keep it limited to one, two minutes maximum, uh, so we have time also for the concluding remarks. Over to you. Yeah. I, I, I can uh, uh, make some remarks uh, as, we, as, we, as we wind up. I think going to the next uh, next iteration of the summit for democracy, uh, uh, we would want to 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 play a part and see more uh, youth coordination and youth presence in uh, body and spirit uh, in the in the in, in in the process influencing the various uh, you know activities uh, happening in the, um, uh, in, the in the in in, in the summit. I think uh, uh, South Korea, as the host, uh, you know, there has to be more demand for commitments related to youth because, as we heard from the report, we are seeing uh, less commitments uh, on youth. Uh, so, you know, the, the host country, Korea, should lead by example, by, you know, uh, making commitments on, on, on youth or pronouncements in, in the lead up to the, to the summit and then encourage other member states, participating states uh, to, um, to have, to consider having commitments that are related to youth. And for example, the Youth Democracy Cohort, which we are a member of already has a menu of possible commitments that uh, you know, uh, any government uh, uh, agency and, and, and department uh, can really uh, adopt and, uh, and, 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 and infuse in their, in their com com uh, commitment and, re and, re and recommendations. I would want to see more, uh, we realize the, the, that the cohorts, even though they are coordinated at cohort level, but there's a lot of scope for uh, organizations within the cohort to network and, and collaborate. Uh, uh, certainly we've seen that uh, the potential of creating networking opportunities for organizations within cohorts and uh, 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 as part of, you know, uh, cohorts uh, uh, work or, or, or activity through through regular connections or whether, whether quarterly or, or something like that that can create space to forge you know more uh, concrete uh, uh, sharing of experiences but also uh, partnerships that can emerge from the from the from the from the cohorts thank you thank you very much uh, with us for that end note any other speaker who would like to come in please do Katerina, Valerio, any last remarks from you? I can uh, come in with, um, I can say in terms of the new uh, deliverables that was mentioned, I think most of us in the cohorts actually had new deliverables in some way. There was never a reusing of old work. Um, there was, as was mentioned, something that was new about it, new actors, uh, new takes on it, et cetera. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Valerio. Last opportunity. Otherwise, yes, please go uh, ahead. Well, I, I agree. I guess uh, Julia mentioned that, uh, and it was the question whether the, these uh, activities took place uh, due to, to the Summit for Democracy or they would have taken place anyways. So I, I guess the, the Summit for Democracy uh, for sure contributed even if the activities were already planned, some of them, uh, some for democracy for sure uh, contributed to speeding up some processes and delivering uh, uh, some some results uh, faster than they would have been delivered. Maybe if uh, it wasn't the summit for democracy, uh, we 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 uh, intend to to implement the recommendations that I've mentioned, and I encourage you to to read them because we uh, we are thinking that there are uh, some some good recommendations which could be further promoted and and uh, uh, why not uh, implemented by by all the states thank you thank you for that valerio and i hope everyone follows your recommendation thanks for that
Uh, it is now with a uh, huge pleasure that I may introduce you Blair Glencoes, who will enlighten us with some concluding remarks. Blair is co-CEO of Accountability Lab. Uh, Accountability Lab, many of you know that, has done an immense job on the Summit for Democracy, and that's since 2021. And we, as an organization and partner, we were blessed with your collaborative spirit, uh, Blair, and the enriching summit activities that you have conducted, such as uh, your uh, summit portal, uh, your contributions to our summit resources portal, and also the activities both online and in countries that we could have pull off, pulled off. We also used some accountability lab graphics in the impact report, so I invite you all to check that out. Blair, I pass on the floor with a big thank you for your engagement and your key expertise. We are keen from, to hear from you now, which are the takeaways that sound uh, the best for you and uh, that you recall from this event. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Adelia, it's such an idea. Thanks for hosting this event. Thanks uh, to everyone for being here. Um, and great to hear Valerio from you on, on some of the important uh, efforts that you made around this, Katarina too, on, on the um, on the cohort that you were part of and, and the value of that uh, part of the Summit for Democracy and, and you, Willis, in particular, on, on the inclusion and youth piece of things, which I agree is is really, really critical. Um, and thanks everyone in the chat, Issa too, Etienne, Katie, Devin, Alex uh, and others for, for some of those ideas. I wasn't able to, to jump in and respond, um, but was following along uh, carefully. and. Um, and so to, to try and sum up a little bit, I thought I could touch on a few of, of what I see of, as the successes uh, of, of the Summit for Democracy based on what we've discussed here in the report, and then perhaps touch on some of the challenges or, or dichotomies that, that the government of Korea could bear in mind as they begin to plan the third summit. Um, I, think, I think the summit, uh, and, and uh, actually before I start to say that, that everyone involved um, uh, deserves credit for this. The both of these summit, the Year of Action, um, were, were huge lifts. Uh, all of the governments that, that we've worked with and all of the civil society organizations that have been part of this have a lot of other competing priorities. I know resources are always scarce. Um, and and there was some truly uh, incredible efforts to to get this going and, and to to create some of the successes that, that there were. And I think the fact that it brought so many different kinds of people together was one really big the success we heard uh, and saw the the graphics from Julia around the different kinds of topics that were part of this, the different kinds of communities that that came together, and that is a a really important piece of this. We don't always talk to each other. A lot of these conversations are stovepiped, um, and it, it provided a mechanism for us to to talk to each other, which is really valuable. Tied many different kinds of conversations together. Um, the year of action, I think, was an important reflection of of this as a learning process. It wasn't just couple of events, there was a, a willingness from the US government and many other partners to, to learn about how to improve this process over time. Um, I don't think we touched on this directly, but the regional summits as part of the second summit for democracy were, I think, a key innovation. It really allowed us to localize these conversations a little to, to your points, Willis, um, and, and bring in slightly different kinds of, of people, which was really important. Some were perhaps more effective than others, but I think that's a, an innovation that, that should continue. Um, the cohorts, I, I think, as we've discussed and, and heard a lot about, were, were the key mechanism here to drive some of these conversations forwards uh, and, and to, to push for some of the outcomes that we were, were looking for. Um, and there was some key visibility through the Summit for Democracy on all sorts of, of issues and for certain countries that, that, um, that we want to begin to lead on these issues globally and it and it kept democracy in the limelight uh, one way or another we can discuss um a little further perhaps around the narratives uh on this but but it has kept this front and center to to certain kinds of conversations uh, that that we need if we are, if we care about democracy which i think we all we all do including in countries that weren't participating in the summit for democracy we did some sentiment analysis of online of, of people that were engaging around the summit and there were a lot of people in places like Uganda and Hong Kong and other countries that weren't necessarily invited to the summit but where we want to continue to encourage um, democratic uh, thinking and, and activism um, so there were there were knock-on effects here beyond just the participating countries and beyond those of us that were engaged formally or 
uh, around the sides of, of the formal process. Um, but I think there are some some dichotomies or, or challenges that we that we need to think about going forwards. One is is what I would frame as control versus autonomy. I think there was a challenge that we we touched on a little bit in the conversation around the, the control of the process by the US government and uh, and the autonomy that other countries or, or civil society had to shape it. Uh, and I'm not sure we ever quite found a balance. Um, and so I think that's something for, for the government of Korea to, to think about going going forwards. Um, it's it's inevitable, and I don't think it's specific to the summit for democracy, but but those that challenge was was there. I think there was a a challenge between process and outcomes. Um, sometimes the process felt a bit like it was the goal, uh, rather than agreed outcomes being the goal, and then the process being the path to get to that goal. And I think the the government of Korea would would do well to to really think hard about what it wants from the third summit, and then work backwards to today to see how we get there collectively. Um, those could be policy changes, it could be commitments from regional organizations, it could be all sorts of things, but I think we need to get a little bit more concrete now about the outcomes to make sure that the, the process fits if it's to continue. I think there was a little bit of a, a balance um, that again was, was not always struck between governments and civil society as part of this process. The cohorts were of course one piece of it, that that allowed for some collaboration, but generally it felt a little bit like we were on parallel tracks talking about the same issues, um, which was reflected in the in the structure of the summit itself. And, and I think we need to think through how we can, as we've discussed, bring bring those two pieces of things together and then bring in other key actors in a, in a more substantive way. The private sector was mentioned. Um, and I think private sector engagement with the second summit was certainly better than the first, but but there's more to do here. And again, that's something I think um, that our Korean colleagues uh, need to, to think about. I think there were challenges in terms of participation versus accountability. We've heard a lot about, about commitments and whether those were measurable and could be fulfilled or not. Participation was was good, but wasn't always as inclusive as it as it could be. And it was very difficult to, to hold governments accountable for what it was that they were committing to. Um, so as as you pointed out, Julia, in your recommendations, I think we need a more structured process for ensuring accountability going forwards uh, and connecting this to critical multilateral uh, and other mechanisms like OGP that can provide the implementation mechanism for uh, for the commitments that are made through uh, the Summit for Democracy. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this is a big one, it's, it's a kind of balance between stories and, and narrative around democracy. And, and I think we were good at uh, telling some stories, but I'm not sure we have yet built the narrative we need to drive our democratic agenda forwards. Democracy delivering um, doesn't feel like enough. It feels a little bit simplistic at this point. We need to better demonstrate the value of democracy and try and build a narrative around it um, through these kinds of engagements and these sorts of uh, events in a slightly more meaningful way. Um, so I know we're running out of, of time, I think, um, the Korean government in the short term uh, need, needs to, as I said, think about the goals here and really get going on, on driving those forwards. Time is of the of the essence. Um, there are a number of key international moments coming up, uh, like the AGP summit, uh, which is in September in Estonia, um, the UNCAC meetings uh, in Atlanta in December, where a lot of these topics will be discussed. We need to use those moments to, to connect the dots here and, and support this global uh, effort that we're, that we're pushing around democracy um, and, and really think about how we can drive forward a lot of the tools that have come out of the, the summit so far. Um, the presidential initiative was mentioned a couple of times as a number of others from other governments. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's not just about the summit and the, and the event itself. It's about the tools. It's about the ideas. Uh, and it's about the narrative, as I, as I pointed out. Um, so thank you, uh, Julia, Marilyn, everyone. This was a fantastic discussion. I look forward to being part of uh, pushing all of this forward and, and um, I hope we can continue this conversation with you uh, as we go. So thank you. And I return that thanks, Blair. Uh, that was brilliant as a conclusion, uh, profound reflections and sound advice coming from you. So thank you very much for that. And we took uh, very careful notes of, of what you said. Well, uh, time is up now. Uh, let me perhaps conclude by saying that it is all about democratic engagement. 
So this engagement uh, of civil society in the summit process, it has been immense, it has been crucial for the success, and it will, as many of you voted um, uh, and, and find, it will be beneficial to make their involvement more structural and official in the continued uh, process. But we need continued engagement at all levels. So the value of the Summit for Democracy process is that it provides that beginning of building a kind of multilateral exchange and mechanism to defend and promote democracy with opportunities for other stakeholders to contribute to it. So we we also thank uh, the US government and uh, South Korea to step up on that and uh, uh, to all the participating countries to, to contribute to this. The political attention to the topic indeed helps promoting it as a priority and it also facilitates more coherent action and, and that is what will be needed to make a real success out of this and to make also the process uh, sustainable. Uh, when we look at commitments that have been made, specific actions uh, that were generated in those cohorts, all of these uh, initiatives will mark the success on the long term. And I also see a link uh, with uh, other initiatives such as Team Europe Democracy, which is more operational in nature, but equally crucial. And so if we can make those links between the political and the operational levels, we come a long way. So uh, thank you all uh, for being here. I invite you to join me in congratulating the team who drafted the report and, and also made this event happen. So Julia Koitgen, Nikolai Paus, Lisa Dalken, Thomas Heinma, thank you so much uh, uh, for making this happen and uh, wish you every success now with the rolling out uh, and promoting of the report. I also uh, would like uh, to thank all of you to contribute to the summit process and also those who helped us doing and conducting this evaluation. Um, please stay tuned uh, for our next event uh, after the summer and do get in touch with us if you have any questions around the report or our other work. Uh, we plan to host a session during the International Democracy Day Brussels conference, which takes place on the 15th of September. And we are hoping uh, to count on participation uh, from uh, the organizers uh, of the summit. So I can now conclude this event, thanking also the EU for uh, the continued support uh, to our project and thanking you all for your time and attention. Everyone have a wonderful day or evening uh, wherever you are and uh, we hope to see you soon.